there. If you smile, you look better. You know, I get worried when I look back and people are not smiling because it makes me think they're mad at me or something. Don't want anybody to be too mad at me. I'm just so thankful to be here tonight. I want to begin by thanking Bethel Baptist Church for inviting me to come and be your evangelist this week. You have blessed my heart. My wife wants to thank you as well. And we appreciate it so much, and I hope that I've not uh, messed Brother Jeremy's ministry up too much over here this week. I also want to uh, thank uh, Bud and Becky Inman. My, what a blessing y'all are to us. I can't, I can't find words to tell you what y'all mean to us, but you're special. And I think most of the people here know Bud and I go back so far we can't count that far. Bud can't. <laughs> but we're thankful. It's been a good time, good years. And then I come up here and whew, Wayne, you and Melba are special. And I want to thank you for singing this week. He was afraid y'all would think that he, uh, he sang too much this week. He was singing a while ago, and I'll be honest with you, Wayne, I was sitting there thinking I could listen to this all day long. And I believe I could. Of course, after a while, I might want to take a nap. <laughs> I've been known to do that. I appreciate you so much. Troy and Wilma, good to see them. I love you guys. I think you know it, but once in a while, we need to tell it. Don't y'all think so? I think we'll say so once in a while. But I just look back through there, and I... I just, I'm so happy. Steve, you married so far up. I know. You and Becky. But anyhow, thank you, thank you, thank you for. Food she okay. <laughs> I want to thank everybody here for all the food you fixed. And the times we went out and all the things that we've done. Uh, I'm afraid Miss Doris going to put me on a strict diet for the next two or three weeks. <laughs> Maybe I'll survive. <laughs> Just so much to say thank you for the bear meat. Where's that at back there? Man, that's good. Whoo, that's good. Some of you who came by and we fellowshiped and we, those who came over and we sang and this has been one of the greatest weeks of my life. And I've had a great time. But I'm not finished. I came here to do a job. And I want to do that job in a way that will please my Lord. So we're looking tonight to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. We'll begin reading with verse 28 and read down through verse 31. Please listen to the word of God tonight. It's not me, but it's God's word and it's so important. It says, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. That takes us back to the law. You know, there were a lot of things in the law that had the death penalty. I've said many times, had I been born under the days of the law, I may not have survived childhood because I wasn't always a good child. Rebellious children, how many of you know what happened to a child that was rebellious? Stoned him to death. Aren't y'all glad we're under grace tonight? But he said, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Now get this next. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Let me interpret that for you. I want you to hear what he's saying. You think it was bad when somebody did not abide by the law of Moses. You think it was bad by, because of those that despise Moses' law. What do you think is going to happen to somebody who sits under the preaching of the word of God 
feels the wooing of the Holy Spirit of God, the conviction of the power of the Holy Spirit of God, and shuns the very blood of Jesus Christ walking over the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world when he stands at the judgment of God. How much sore punishment do you think he's going to be found worthy? For we know him that said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord knoweth how to judge, or the Lord shall judge his people. But it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Y'all listening to me tonight? My message tonight is where do lost people go when they die? Where do lost people go when they die? Let me tell you something, and y'all get this tonight. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Right. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil. Now he's comforted. Thou art tormented. Besides all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed, so that they that would pass from thence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him back to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify to them, lest they also come unto this place, this awful place, toward me. Abraham said, they have Moses and prophets, that's the beauty. He said, no, Father Abraham, it's amazing how lost people think they know more than God. Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they'll repent. And Abraham said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, my preacher men, my men who I have called to preach the word of God, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. It's not a miracle people need, folks. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, we come into your presence tonight to thank you for your word. And just to pray, Lord, that you'll bless your word tonight. Bless all these wonderful people who come to hear the word tonight. Lord, we're here for you, and we want to glorify you, and we want you to be pleased with the things that we say to you tonight. Lord, we love you. Oh, we love you. But our love for you is such a minor thing when we think about how much you love us. And all we can do is say thank you for that. I know tonight, Lord, that you love everybody in this building. Lord, my burden tonight is for that one or two or three or ever how many there may be that does not know you as their Savior. I don't know who they are, but I know that you do. I don't know what involved in their life. I don't know what they're having to deal with, but I know that you do. But I also know that there's nothing in this world more important than their coming to know you and being saved by the grace of God. Lord, I pray tonight that this message will be taken seriously. Because, Lord, people need you tonight. Hell is a real place. There are many, many people there right now. And everyone that's there wishes that they took time to trust you and, and get saved. So, Lord, I, I just pray that the people here won't wait too late. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If we think about our message this evening, where do lost people go when they die? My thought is, where do lost people go when they die? And what's it like? 
What's it like? You know, we talk a lot about the dead in Christ. I love to preach about how beautiful heaven must be. Boy, I like to think about heaven and I like to hear these songs that we sing and we sing about heaven. I think there are probably a lot more songs in our book about heaven, Wayne, than there are about hell. You know, it's hard to find anything. You know what? We don't want to talk about it. We don't have anybody want to sing about it. I couldn't get Wayne to sing one on hell. <laughs> couldn't find one, could you, Wayne? I found one hymn with the word in it <laughs> one time. That's it. That's because we like to talk about heaven, but we don't want to talk about hell. But hell's real, folks. Hell is just as real as heaven is. There is a place called hell. And you know, we sing about heaven when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. You know, I had a music director, and I used to tell him, don't say 10,000, say forevermore. Man, we can run out of 10,000 after a while, and as fast as they go for me, it might not take very long. <laughs> Sing it forevermore when we've been in heaven forevermore. Bright shining as the sun with no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. But where do lost people go when they die? And what's it like? What about that? I remember in God's Word where the Apostle Paul preached to a man by the name of Agrippa. Y'all remember King Agrippa and Paul was preaching to Agrippa and old Agrippa was listening to what Paul had to say and God's Spirit was working on King Agrippa and King Agrippa looked at Paul and said, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian, but as far as we know, there's no place in the Bible that says he was ever persuaded. There's no place in the Bible that said Agrippa ever gave in and put his trust in Jesus Christ so he went to hell. And where's he at today? And what's it like? There was another gentleman by the name of Felix. Paul preached to a man named Felix and the Holy Spirit was working on Felix to the point that Felix actually trembled as he said to Paul, Go thy way. When I have a convenient season, I'll call for you. But the convenient season never came. And he said, Hell today. What's it like for King Agrippa and for Felix today? We read in God's Word, it says, Broad is the way that leads to destruction, that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. I ask you tonight, where are they at? And what's it like? And in this message tonight, I have a, a plan. My desire is, I want to make you understand what hell is like and what people have to deal with who leave this life unprepared to meet God. I want you to get it. I'd like to make it so plain tonight that not one person would want to stay in their lost condition. I'd like to make it so plain tonight. And I want you to understand tonight it's not for me, but it's for you. I want you to realize where you're headed. And I want you to realize how serious it is. And I want you to know how great you need to be saved tonight. There's nothing in this world more important than being saved. I can tell you tonight that when you die, if you die without Jesus Christ, you go to a place that was originally planned for the devil and his angels. That's what the scripture tells us in Matthew 25, 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. It was not meant. Our God did not mean. He did not want people to go there. He prepared that place for the old evil one who rose up against God in, when he was in heaven and said, I'm going to be like the most high God. And by the way, just like that, God sent him to this earth. Jesus said, I beheld Satan like lightning. I think that's how fast you get to ground. But I want you to know, hell has enlarged itself today because the multitudes of people who refuse to receive our Lord's atonement for sin. You see, God looked down on man. God knew what was going to happen when he made man. But here man is in the Garden of Eden and he's got everything that he needs and it's a wonderful life. And yet man, he chooses to, do, to, to go against God. He, he chooses to rebel against God and he plunged the whole human race 
into sin. And so God said we've got to do something. And God sent His Son because He wanted man to have everlasting life. And Jesus came to be the Savior of the whole world. It's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If you're here tonight and you're lost, I can tell you that if you go out of this place unprepared to meet God, it won't be the will of God, but it'll be by your choice that you choose to do that because our Lord has done everything He can to keep you from going to hell. Amen. I want you to know that that's why He gave us His Son. That's why Jesus came. Y'all remember Jesus said, I must needs go through Jericho. And on his way through Jericho, there was that little short man. I think we've already mentioned him this week. That little short man named Zacchaeus. And he ran and he climbed up into a sycamore tree. What do we tell our kids? Because the Lord, he wanted to see. And Jesus knew where he was at. Jesus knows all things, just like he does today. And Jesus went by that tree and said, get out from there, Zacchaeus. I'm going to your house today. And somewhere between the limb he was on and the ground, when he came down, he got saved. Amen. He found Jesus as his Savior. And what did Jesus say about Zacchaeus? He said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why Jesus came into this world to be our Savior. That's his number one goal is to redeem man from his sin. When he was stretched on that cross and he cried out, it's finished. What was he saying? I've paid the price. I've done what's necessary. Everybody, everywhere can be saved today. Anybody goes to hell, they go there on their own. Jesus has done everything he can. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Our Lord doesn't want you to go there, friend. And I'm saying to you, you don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. Let me tell you, not only has he given us his son, but he's given us his Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is here today. And God said that my word would not uh, return to me void. I'm here to tell you that every time the word of God is preached, the Spirit of God is always there. Amen. I want you to know that in our building tonight, all through this building, God's Spirit is moving. He may be working in your heart tonight. If He is, you know what I'm talking about. You know how I know all this? Because I've been there. Anybody that's saved has been there. I'll do this. How many of you children of God remember when you go to church and the Holy Spirit would grip your heart and pull on your heart and pull you, telling you, I want to save you. How many of you remember those days? Amen. Yes, we've been there. I'm trying to make it a little easier for you. If you're here and you're lost, you know when you come down this aisle, you know, the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you and begins to prick your heart. But the old devil said over there, oh, you don't need to do that tonight. You can do that another night. You can wait a little while. My friend, I'm going to tell you what, you may not get wait a little while. We don't know about tomorrow. All we know for sure is we've got right now. And we know that right now you can be saved. But if you put it off, you may put it off like this multitude of people that are in hell today. Every one of them wishes they stop what they were doing. Nothing to them is more important than salvation today. Amen. And I'm here to tell you if you're lost, there's nothing more important than your being saved today. God gave us the Spirit. I want to tell you something else He did. He put this church here. And He gave this church the responsibility of preaching and preserving the Word of God. One of the biggest responsibilities of a church is that she is the custodian of the truth. If we do anything, church, we need to make sure that we have the truth. We need to make sure that we preach the truth. We need to make sure that people hear the truth. What is the truth? Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. There is no salvation aside from Jesus. That's the truth. I can tell you that God sent His Son, Jesus. I can tell you that Jesus came to this world. I can tell you that He came, the innocent, perfect Lamb of God, and He was born in innocent there in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane or 
in the, by the city of Bethlehem, he was born in perfection. He is the perfect Lamb of God. There's no flaw in him. There's no sin that was ever committed by our Savior. That's right. But I can tell you that he lived that sinless life only to go to that old rugged cross and hang on that cross and die for the sin of all mankind. And I tell you that all our sin nailed him to that cross. That's right. And held him there. And tell you that he came down off that cross, they buried him. And I can shout for joy with you today and tell you that three days later he came out of that grave. Amen. Victorious over death, hell and the grave. I can tell you that he walked among men, seen about 500 brethren uh, while he walked on this earth. He ascended to the Father. I can tell you that he sits at the right hand of the Father and he's interceding, he's ever interceding for sinners. And when we cry to the Lord and we confess our sin and repent, he saves us right then. Amen. God's in his church. Let me tell you something else God does. Because He doesn't want people to go to hell. He calls preachers to preach the Lord. Amen. Now, I don't know what you believe. I just know what the Bible teaches. And the Bible preaches and teaches God called preachers. Amen. The Bible teaches and preaches spirit led preachers. Amen. I believe with all my heart tonight that Jeremy Jones is a God called spirit led preacher. And I'll re reiterate what I've already said. Every member of this church ought to sit under every sermon God gives that man because God gives that man those sermons for you. You ought not to skip out on any of them. Nothing ought to take the place in your life of hearing the message God has for you here. But I can tell you, dear friend, that we need to get everybody we know that's lost under the preaching of the Word of God. We need to get them under the preacher so that God's Holy Spirit can convict of sin. They can repent of sin and put their faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. I can't, I can't emphasize enough how much our Lord loves you tonight. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But I want to tell you, when people die lost, they go to a place of torment. Amen. They go to a place of torment. In Revelation 14, verse 11, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. There is torment. There's the torment of the flame. Do you remember there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid in his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with crumbs which fell from the rich man's table more than all that came and licked his sores. Came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried and in hell, listen, underline that, in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torment. I don't know what all the torments are. I'll cover a few of them tonight. But I can tell you that there's more than one torment involved when a man goes to hell. He lift up his eyes being in torments. Seeth Abraham afar off and lies within his bosom. And he cried, listen to that. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazar that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. There is the torment of the flame. It is a place where the worm doth not and the fire is not quenched. Horrible thought. There's the torment of the flame. There's the torment of separation. See, that's what the word death is, separation. When we have someone die in our family, they're separated from us. We have to, we have to bury them in the ground because we, we cannot have them around us anymore. They are separated from us by death. But I want to tell you a little something about spiritual death. When someone dies outside of Jesus Christ, they are separated from the presence of a holy God forever. Amen. They're separated from God. Not just people, but from God. The wages of sin is death, spiritual death. I want to tell you, to die lost is to go to a place of eternal torment. There's the torment of memory. 
What did Abraham say to the rich man? Son, remember. I don't know what all you'll remember, but I think you may have perfect memory in hell. I think you're going to remember them dear old saints who prayed for you. Boy, I remember when we, when I was a boy growing up in them little country churches. Let me tell you something. There ain't nothing wrong with country churches. Amen. We may have had the, we may have had the toilets out and back. The trail's going to. Pot belly stove in the middle. I remember it as much as if I were there today. But I want to tell you something. You'd hear them dear old saints get up and pray. And some of them little old grandmas would pray. And their hearts was broken. And they'd be praying and tears flowing down their eyes. As they prayed for God to save their children and their grandchildren. The people who meant so much to them. They were pouring out their heart to God. Because of the burden that was on their heart. Because they realized there's nothing in the world more important than Jesus Christ. Amen. We need some more grandmas like that today. Amen. folks. We need some more people that got a burden for their family. I don't know. I think you'll remember the gospel songs that we're singing. I mean, Wayne may not can find a song on hell, but he can sure find a bunch of them and tell you how to be saved. I'm going to tell you, we do like to sing about the gospel. Boy, I'm thankful for that because I think that's more important. Maybe, I don't know, but anyhow, you work on it. <laughs> Next time I preach a revival, Wayne's going to have a song written on hell. That'll be interesting. <laughs> I don't know. I think you'll remember the Sunday school teachers that talked. Maybe some old deacon that come by and talked to you about your need of salvation. Maybe you're going to remember the messages that you heard from the Word of God. If you die and go to hell, you're probably going to remember the message that was preached by Verlin Wood right here in this church. Maybe you'll remember funeral reminders. You know what a funeral reminder is when you see there's going to be a funeral and some friend of yours is going to be die, has died and going to be buried. You know what usually pops into your mind? That's going to be me one of these days. What that needs to be doing for you is telling you you need to prepare to meet your God. A funeral is just a reminder. You see a hearse go by. It ought to remind you, I better get ready. One of these days, I'm going to be there. I, won't, I don't want you to get feeling bad, but I won't tell you the truth tonight. There's not anybody here that's not going to die unless we get raptured. Amen. We might, might make it to the rapture. But even if we get raptured, we're going to be changed in a moment. But if you lost, you ain't going to get raptured. You're going to be left behind. That's the scary part. Let me tell you, it is, it, it, the Bible says, son, remember all these things. Remember the death of loved ones. Every time you ever considered being saved and said no, you're going to remember it. There's the torment of your memory. Son, remember. And I say to you tonight, don't go to hell. Get saved. To die lost. It's to go to a place of no more mercy. You don't want to go there, friend. It's a place where there is no mercy. This rich man lift up his eyes, at being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. But guess what? He didn't get mercy. He waited too late. He had gone beyond the reach. Of God's mercy. There's no mercy in hell. There's no mercy there. The most amazing thing is that while he walked in this life, mercy was everywhere. In this life, there is an abundant mercy. Peter wrote about it in 1 Peter 1 and 3 when he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again, hath saved us again, hath made us new creatures in Christ, hath caused us to be born anew and into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Mercy. As long as there's breath in your life this, tonight, you can get mercy. Amen. And what you need to be doing is falling on your face as a repentant sinner and crying out to our Lord for mercy in his salvation today. Amen. No greater need than that that you could have today. In the book of Isaiah 55 verse 7, 
Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and unto our God for he will abundantly pardon. That's what, you see our Lord is he, anxious to save you. He wants to save you. He doesn't want you to perish. But listen friend, he's not going to make a robot out of you. He's not going to just reach down and make you his child. You've got to come to the point that you reach out to him and call on him because that's the way it happens. You're a free moral agent. Simply means God gives you the choice. You choose Jesus or you choose to reject him. And guess what? You're going to make that choice tonight. Every lost person in this building is going to make that choice. If you get saved, you will, you'll be choosing Jesus. But if you walk out that door unsaved, you're going to be choosing to reject Jesus. One more time. I don't know. You may not get many more. Only God knows. To die lost is to go to a place filled with unbelievers and bad company. No, you don't want to go there. You know, I'm going to tell you, there's some people I don't like to be around. You say, preacher, you better than somebody else? No, sir. No, ma'am. But there's some people I don't want to be around. I'm going to tell you, I don't want to be around the homosexuals. That's just the way I am. One of them old weirdos run up and put his arm around me, I'm going to mop the floor with him. He said, Preacher, you're an old man. So I'll get me an equalizer. <laughs> that nobody knows what that is. It's called a ball bat. <laughs> I don't know. I want you to see, I want, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. But, but he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And John wrote in Revelation 21 and 8, And the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Boy, we're going to rub elbows with some kind of people, aren't we? No, I ain't. The lost are. Amen. The lost are. That's what the Bible says. Murderers, adulterers, whoremongers, thieves, liars, cheaters, homosexuals, all kinds of vulgar people. I go into a building and they're using nasty words and taking God's name in vain. I find a way to leave. Amen. They'll be blaspheming God for eternity in hell. You think about that. That's what you're going to be around. People that were just mean, vile, wicked people. That's what hell is full of. But let me tell you, it's all so full. All of them have one thing in common. See, I want to tell you something, folks. You don't go to hell because you're a homosexual. No. Oh, I, that's right. Somebody's going to look. I'm getting some looks tonight. <laughs> you don't go to hell because you're a thief. No. You don't go to hell because you commit murder. No. You go to hell because you reject Jesus. Amen. You reject the, the gift of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That's why you go to hell. And if you go to hell, you're going to rub elbows with everybody that's in hell. To die lost is go to a place of unsatisfied desires. I'm telling you, you don't want to go there. Old Lazarus had to desire. The rich man had to desire. The rich man had to desire for just a drop of water on the tongue of Lazarus that would give him a little bit of relief from the agony of the pain of the fire. I can't imagine what kind of flame that would be, what kind of heat that would be. That just a tiny drop of moisture from the finger of somebody could give you some relief. But he prayed and he didn't get it. He didn't get his desire. He gone too far. Then he had a desire, got to be a pretty good fella, and he got to thinking about his brothers. He had five brothers in the same shape he was in. You know, someone preached a message one time, six boys, one in hell, five on the way. That's what was going on here. One of them was already there, and five more was headed that way. It's about time mamas and daddies took a look at their families and saw what they, what's really there. Are your children saved? I want to tell you something, friend. There's some things more important than education. There's some things more important than them being a good person playing baseball or softball or basketball or whatever it may be. There's some things more important than people having fun in life. I want to tell you there's one thing greater than anything and that's being right with God. Amen. Saved by grace, there's nothing
nothing more important than that. He was worried about his brothers. And he wanted a miracle. You see, that's the world today. They want a miracle. Hey, the miracle you need, friend, is Jesus Christ. Amen. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Can't come to the Father except by Him. It's not a miracle. It, God's not going to treat you or anybody else any better than He does everybody else. I mean, that's it. We're saved by grace through faith plus nothing minus nothing. The Holy Spirit convicts by the preaching of the Word of God. That's the way God operates. He's always done that way. He'll always do that way. He's not going to change. If you're going to be saved, you better listen to the Word. You better heed the Word. You better repent of sin and call on Jesus to be your Savior. To die lost is to go to a place of no escape. No escape. I never will forget one time I was talking to a man. I think it was... Northwest Arkansas. We've got a young lady here from the, the lives up there. No, she's over in Oklahoma. She's in northeast Oklahoma. Where's she at back there? There she is. Hiding back there. I was talking to a guy in Northwest Arkansas years ago before I lived up there. And I was talking to him about hell. You know what he said? So I believe if I die and go to hell, God will, God will give me another chance later on. I said, Really? Amen. It ain't there, folks. No way. If it was dry, it'd be there. But what the Bible said, they have no rest day nor night. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. There is no second chance in hell. Amen. It's not going to happen. To die lost is to go to a place of no escape. Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus the evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, uh, can, uh, to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. There is no escape. That's right. Preacher. No preacher is going to come and and, and, and give you a second chance. He's not going to pray uh, you out of hell. There's nobody has the power. No priest has the power to pray you out of some part of hell. There's not going to be some missionary come down there and preach and give you another chance. In this place, it's too late and there are no more opportunities. Amen. To die lost is to go to a place one does not have to go. Thank God for that. Nobody has to go to hell. Write that down. Nobody has to go to hell. There's going to be a lot of people go, but they don't have to go. You know how I know? Because Jesus paid the sin debt for us all. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, it says, For he, talking about God, hath made him, talking about Jesus, to be sin for us, this Jesus who knew no sin, that we, you and I, might be made the righteousness of God in him. Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Get that. The wages of sin is separation from God. The wages of sin is eternal damnation in hell. But the gift of God is eternal life. It's life with Jesus in heaven. It's going to heaven and that's where we'll be forever. You don't have to go to hell. You can go to heaven tonight. Jesus is the way to heaven. Jesus is the only way to heaven. But he's the sure way. What did Jesus say in John 14, 6? Y'all remember Thomas was there? He's one of the most probably best missionary Baptists there was there. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He don't want us to be troubled. He wants us just to trust Him. In my Father's house are many mansions. If we're not told, we told you. And then He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again, receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Well, I like that. Where I go, you know, and the way you know, and Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. And how can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. 
I am the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. Peter got a hold of that and the very next chapter in the book of Acts, Peter got to preaching. He said, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name among, uh, given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus. You don't have to go to hell. You can go to heaven. To be saved, dear friend, to be saved, one must repent of his sin. Again, not have enough preaching on repentance. If you don't repent, you don't get saved. What is repentance? Turning from sin. It's turning from sin to Jesus. That's what it all amounts to. Turning from sin to Jesus. Jesus said this in Luke 13, verse 1. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Or he said those 18 upon whom the tower of Siloam fell, do you think they were greater sinners than everybody else? I tell you nay, no, but except you repent, you all likewise perish. Now, what did they have in common? What did those people have in common? They didn't all sacrifice. Pilate didn't mingle all their blood with their sacrifices. They didn't all die with a tower falling on them. But I'll tell you why they perished. They perished because they had never trusted Jesus as their Savior. They all had that one thing in common. And he said, if you don't repent, you're going to perish. So I'm pleading with people tonight. Turn from sin to Jesus. Amen. Turn from sin to Jesus. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul told the Philippian jailer when he called for a light and sprang him in among them and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. To the Ethiopian eunuch who said to Philip, If thou uh, here's water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest, you see, baptism don't save, and baptism follows salvation. And if you're not saved when you get baptized, you're not baptized. But he said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. You've got to be a child of God. And you've got to trust Jesus to be a child of God. Jesus tells us we must believe. John 3, 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So to be saved, turn from sin to Jesus. Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. My plea with you tonight is, if you're listening and you're not saved, get saved tonight. Quit thinking about what people think. Quit thinking about what's going on around you. Quit thinking about maybe there'll be another chance because we don't know about that. I heard a story one time about a preacher while our musicians are coming, we're preparing an invitation. I heard a story about a preacher one time. Brother Locke was his name. He a member of the church I pastored in Daylight. Just passed away very shortly. Was pastor the church. A bunch of kids, they're coming, cocky kids coming, driving up there and making fun of the preacher. They yelled at the preacher, said, preacher down because he's one of the preachers about to talk to people about you. Preacher, how far is it to hell, they said. They get their gas and they get in their car and they speed up. Eight miles down the road, they wrecked that car and one of them died. You know how far it was to hell? Eight miles. Eight miles. I'm telling you, it's time to prepare for God. Amen. No guarantees of tomorrow. Seek ye the Lord's holy may be found. Call your phone, Lord. Today is the day of salvation. I'm begging you, whoever you are. Let's put all that junk aside. Man. It's time to get serious with ourselves and with God. Because hell is full of people who have good intentions but never met those intentions. 